Well, a very good morning to you. Good morning, Owen. I, for one, welcome this new trend that we've got where a golf major is celebrated like an All-Ireland victory. <laughs> this is how it's supposed to be done. Oh, yeah. Jordan Spieth, Brooks Kepke, take note. You've got to show up to the Boar's Head the Monday for a day session after winning a major these days. You've got to go for a homecoming in a GEA stronghold, and Shane Lowry is doing that. He's doing it right. It's very, I'm, I'm always down um, in the boring... Um, well, I shouldn't say it. it's, it's a lovely hotel, the Gibson Hotel, but it's, uh, I'm always sent down there to get the post-match interviews with the successful dubs after they've won the All-Ireland. But all the cracks down at the Boar's Head, boar's head isn't it? Yeah. I'm always getting texts off friends and all, you know, all the lads are down. Like that's, we see, that's where all the, all the lads who having a few points are, you know, all the, the, the boring guys who went to bed early and decide to um, do the interviews with us the next morning. They're always down in the Gibson Hotel, but the crack's always in the Boar's Head, isn't it? Yeah, Monday mornings are boring <laughs> everywhere, except for the Boar's Head, especially yeah. after the big sporting events. So you get it after All-Ireland wins, and it's great for the pub to get so much publicity as well yesterday. It is. Yeah. It's one of the great haunts, great people who run it as well. Good Kevin GAA family, I believe, aren't Absolutely. they? Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, the, the Hurricanes, they're actually very good to us here and off the ball. We needed yeah. a, a spot for a video there last year when we were interviewing Emma Fitzmaurice after he lost the Kerry job, or after he left the Kerry job. And uh, Tommy got in touch with them, and they were like, yeah, use the, the top floor is all yours, <laughs> film away up there. Well, funny you say that because and I love the pub, they do a lovely pint of Guinness and all that, but the top, uh, the, the upper floor holds some bad memories for me. Oh yeah? That's where I was when that fateful night when Thierry Henry uh, handled that ball and held France into the World Cup. Way to kill the mood at half past yeah. seven this morning. <laughs> I, like, sometimes I have to go to the bathroom up there and you, I just feel like even a pain in my heart walking up those stairs thinking about that faithful noise and just the absolute devastation amongst me and my friends as we sat there just nursing our nursing our points but there you go anyway on. yeah for anybody out there who's got any great or terrible boar's head memories you can tweet us at <laughs> off the ball um, it, like, it does kind of feel like supporting a team win over the last couple of days I think there is I think we're all kind of riding the crest of a wave he's still on the front pages and the back pages of a lot of the newspapers again this yeah. morning it's been incredible you've obviously met him a few times yeah I, I, I remember him interviewing when uh, I was with 98FM and I was sent out to interview him in Greystones Golf Club I think he was doing something out there with Paul Dunn who was only just coming onto the scene I think he just won the Irish Open himself and uh, it's like he's just so funny because I w we were kind of sent off into a room together on our own just to do this one on one so there was no noise or anything like that and uh, we walked in I turned on my microphone car and he says uh, do you like Oasis? <laughs> 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 I said, well, you know, maybe maybe not as much as I used to, Shane, but yeah, I would have been a fan How back in the tell? day. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and he was kind of, but just this, he has this lovely expression, it's like childlike wonder in his face, and he, he started interviewing me almost, you know, he was yeah. like, and he said, so what, what do you kind of be covering mostly? And I said, well, you know, Len I do a lot of Leinster rugby. He said, oh, I love Leinster rugby. He said, I'm a big, uh, big into Leinster rugby, trying to get down to the games. Because he, he's just an all-around sports fan, isn't he? Yeah. Um, but he's just one of those fellas where he totally disarmed me. And then it was like him chatting away to me for a few minutes. And I was just, you know, you just cannot help love the guy. And I think everybody, even people who might not have known him too much before this weekend, are starting to see that this guy is one of the most likeable loveliest fellas in sport when in sport which has become such a cynical you know thing maybe over the last decade or so with you know so many issues and that kind of thing around it but Shane is just he's a breath of fresh air and you know more power I really hope he kicks off from here look I and I you know I hate boiling it all down to money I was reading a great interesting piece in the independent last night just saying that what this is going to be worth to him now with endorsements all the different majors that he's going to be he's, he's invited now to the next five editions of each of the big majors in America you know, this this is going to send him into the stratosphere now. Like he's he's an absolute superstar, superstar, and well deserved. One hundred percent. We're going to get into that a little bit later on as well because you've got awfully man Paul Rouse joining us in studio. We've also got Mark Ty of the Sunday Times with us a little bit later on as well. He's obviously been leading a brilliant journalistic charge in terms of information about the FAI over the past few months. Sunday's edition of the newspaper obviously had new information about the FAI, and we'll get into that very shortly. He was in studio with us uh, after we finished up the live show yesterday morning and he had this to say about Donald Conway. This is all based on optics but Donald Conway running unopposed for his role within the FAI isn't a good look in, on a PR front. We don't know what is going to happen here. The EGM was at the weekend. He could stay for another year. He might not. We, we don't know what's going to happen. Like In your view, is there a movement within the FAI that the Donald Conway thing is actually bad optics for the organisation and therefore people within the FAI should act? I don't think there is a strong uh, concern about that really in the FAI. I think, you know... Uh, Should there be? 
Possibly, yeah. Look, I don't think the state funding, like Shane Ross has staked his reputation on this and, mm -hmm. you know, he's, he, I, I can't see any state funding. We write about the IRFU brought into this because the Aviva upgrade has to happen before 2020 and there's, the IRFU um, are going to have to put their hands in their pockets and okay. cover the full amount possibly of this. It's, um, it's a five million total to revamp the Aviva, but 70% would have been covered by the state normally and um, the, uh, instead that's 3.2 million split 50 50 between the FAI and the IRFU so the first time this crisis is impacting on the IRFU having to dip into their own pockets to cover that, those upgrades. I can understand like Donald Conway if you, if, if, if you read our piece you know you can see why he, he helped push the Jonathan Hall report um, through with John Delaney and I think you know obviously he's got legal advice that he can't um, talk about John Delaney or else John Delaney will go running to the High Court. I think that's that's why Donald Conway, any time he gets that question, he just bats it away, you know, and that's obviously not satisfactory for the public. Uh, I think the, the FBI uh, people understand that, that they don't want to leave themselves legally exposed. Um, I, I was interested to listen to Stuart Gilhooley, the uh, Professional Football Association of Ireland solicitor last week, where, you know, he was praising Donald Conway, saying there's been a complete sea change, because he's really got in there and put, got his feet under the table like a president he would be kind of a figurehead but since John Delaney has moved aside he's taking a lot of uh, the reins and the day to day control and I think he has done a lot and, and changed things and he's opened up dialogues along with Noel Mooney and that's encouraging so you know he's brought in people like John Delaney he, he was at war with so many factions in the FAI when he was in charge and unnecessarily you know that, and people like the PFAI um it was just a horrible situation they were in, you know, and with so many uh, different uh, clubs and uh, fr uh, associations within the FAI, there, there was just ju kind of a warlike situation with John Delaney. And that, in fairness to Donald Conway, he's brought people and said, Look, you're all in the tent now, we're, we're going to listen to you. You know, it's not, it's not una voce. Um, so I think that's why there isn't, or there is support for Donald Conway to stay there. And I think, you know, that's what's going to happen. He, he will be the president for the, ele re elected as president next Saturday. Yeah, that is interesting. I mean, there, we were speaking about this when you were in last week. There is the very easy thing to say that this looks incredibly bad, but ultimately, do you give him a chance? Is that way too forgiving that he, that he can be that person who brings other voices inside the tent that is a, a listener rather than somebody who actually just runs the show his way? Yeah, um, I, well, thinking about that, I think also what Mark said there about the RFU was quite yeah, interesting. Yeah, that was an interesting that's, angle on Sunday, wasn't it? You know, it's, that's 1.6 million euro of IRFU money, where was that meant to go? You know, if, if they do have to dig in their, into their pockets because mm. the government don't front up, where if and, uh, where does that money get taken from? Like, do the IRFU now have to take money from their own grassroots projects? Um, I, I don't know, like it's, can the IRFU now put pressure on the government and say, well look, we're not happy about this. Um, that, and you know, the RFU have to, or the FAI have to have a relationship with the RFU. They're sharing a, a, a home, mm. and if relations there get bad between those two, well, then what happens then? You know, like, are the RFU going to start putting public pressure on the FAI to say, well, look, you guys better do, you know, do what the government tell you to do because we need this funding. We can't afford to take this funding away from our grassroots programs or wherever that money is meant to go. But. Yeah, just um, it doesn't. It really doesn't look good. I can understand what's being said about Donald Conway and that, you know, he is trying now to get things. But like, it's this is all very late, you know. Um, and again, it just it doesn't look good. No. The optics aren't good. And we yeah, and like we will get into that. And we have seen as well from Ty's piece last weekend what exactly was going on, or we see a lot of what was going on anyway over the last couple of months and how things have changed and how the name did have a lot of supporters in the FAI as well. So there's definitely two sides to this, and uh, we will be coming bring that uh, very shortly indeed. Sports pages is what we're leading with though in just a moment or so. Then Paul Rouse after Mark Ty at twenty past eight talking about the GEA and their decision making process. Then at around 8.40, Alan Quinlan will be joining us in studio talking about England, Danny Cipriani not in their latest World Cup squad, the power rankings, the unflappable GEA Specsavers power rankings coming your way at 5 to 9. Deal or no deal then at 10 past 9, a bit to talk about there. And then Nick Royal will be joining us before we wrap up this morning because Ireland are in Lords tomorrow morning for their first ever test against England, their third ever test in the history of cricket. So it's a big week uh, for Irish cricket. Uh, before we get into the back pages, have a look at this. Join off the ball in Abu Dhabi this November 17th to 23rd for the inaugural...
Off the Ball Open. With flights from Dublin, five nights in a four-star hotel, Dolphin 2 Championship courses, gala awards dinner, Peter Laurie Golf Clinic, and a live Off the Ball Roadshow. You can also hang out with some special guests, including Kevin Kilban and Kieran Donaghy. The inaugural Off the Ball Open. Book now at CassidyTravel.ie and check out OffTheBall.com. Going to start this morning with the son. The lead story on the back says, Make me the leader. His plea after £170 million jackpot, 117. That's David De Gea wanting to show his commitment to Manchester United by becoming club captain. You've got come along for the ride, Shane. Paul G. Carrington wants Shane Larry to spearhead his Ryder Cup team next year. And John O'Shea has joined Reading's coaching staff after asking advice from his old Manchester United boss, Alex Ferguson. John De Job says the headline there. Great appointment, mm -hmm. I think. I, the one thing that always struck me about John O'Shea um, when he was captain of Ireland, even as a player, when you would interview him, mix zones are the worst places to try and get interviews after games, uh, speaking to coaches or players, whatever the case may be. But John always had this great ability to, even in that heat at the moment, to break down a game and to analyse even those few minutes that you might just be talking to him. I just think there's there's the makings of a manager there, a really good manager, and it's great to see him getting his first steps in coaching in a, at a, at a good, well run club and at a decent level as well. For sure. The front page of the Irish Sun goes with uh, the best Shane Larry, let's go with it, the best Shane Larry story there is this morning. Come back Shane, we're open. Shelburne no longer out of bounds for legend Larry. So this is their front page exclusive. Ireland's poshest hotel has told Open champ Shane Lowry he's welcome to pop in for a pint after he was previously refused entry on a night out. Shane said he was turned away from Dublin Shelburne while on a Christmas night out in 2013, tweeting that they don't let normal people in. But last night a hotel spokeswoman told us all the team at the Shelburne are delighted for Shane Lowry after his historic win at the Open. Of course he is welcome at the Shelburne. So for anybody who missed this, I completely forgot about this, to be honest. The County Offaly man took to Twitter to say the hotel did not let my mates and I in. This was after a night out in 2013, or during a night out in 2013. Asked on Twitter why he was refused entrance to the hotel on St. Stephen's Green in the capital, Larry replied that they don't let normal people in. The golfer included the hashtag KIP in his tweets. <laughs> in another tweet, the Clara native said, for a start, they only had two pints, and that they weren't let in because of what they looked like, even though we looked well. So, now, the well, Shelburne have done a U-turn. You, I suppose you are a normal person like Shane. Thank you. Um, and if something like this happens to you, the Shelburne come you know, back cap in hand, you've you know, won maybe the PPI Sports Broadcaster of the Year, and they come to you cap in hand and say, look, Owen, we, we're welcoming you back here with open arms. Would you be happy with that, or would you want some, you know, a bit more of a gesture, maybe? I think I'll sip, sip on my pint in the boar's head and stay put <laughs> exactly where I am. With the rest of the normal screen. people. Exactly. Exactly. Um, just moving along to the Irish Times, and it's a um, really interesting piece here. Dunn urges McCarthy to get Parrott in the senior squad. And, of course, that's about 17-year-old uh, Tottenham striker and Dublin-born Troy Parrott, of course, who um, made a senior well senior debut of sorts in Tottenham's uh, pre-season friendly against uh, Juventus. At 17, the Dublin-born striker, writes John Fallon in the Irish Times, has been promoted to the Spurs team first team by Maurizio Pochettino, starting and starring on his debut in Sunday's friendly against Juventus. He made a brilliant run actually for that first goal, just to kind of take the uh, move a couple of the defenders out of the way. The, the shot was saved by Buffon but then uh, Spurs scored with the rebound but uh, Richard Dunn says we're lacking goal scorers and pacing the team and the 80 times capped former Ireland defender speaking yesterday at the Festival of Football we can't wait forever for kids to become first team regulars before they play for Ireland if they're almost first team squad members at Premier League clubs they won't be a million miles off our team You were watching the under 19s I presume at the weekend Yeah Are we going to beat Portugal? Um, look Portugal are the reigning champions tough game we're going to be without two of our best players Afalabi Leo Connor both got suspended with ridiculous second yellow cards, it has to be said. But um, look, this Tom Moan has this incredible ability to get the, the players that he brings in, because as we all know, well publicised, 11 players missing going into this tournament, including Troy Parrott. He has an incredible ability to get the best out of what he has um, in front of him. And I think I wouldn't write them off. I definitely wouldn't write them off. And I also think Joe Hodge is somebody, a bit like Richard Dunn is saying here about Troy Parrott, who should be maybe fast tracked. Maybe not into the senior squad, but there'd be no harm in Mick McCarthy bringing Joe Hodge in, just to give him a taste of what it's like to be around the squad, that kind of thing. 
with a view to, the, to maybe Stephen Kenny then uh, bringing him in when he takes over eventually. But um, Kenny Cunningham, speaking about Joe Hodge, Tommy's just telling me here that he compared him to Nasher from Bino against yeah. Czech Republic. But he's a lovely <laughs> little footballer too, as much as, as, as Nasher. I'm not sure if that's Tommy's words or Kenny's words, Tommy's words. Yeah, yeah, I think uh, he, sp- exp- uh, he was commentating with Darren Maloney who said uh, maybe there's a lot of uh, people out there who might know who you're talking about, Kenny. Uh, so he's like kind of explained that it was the Bino comic character. Do kids read the Bino comic anymore? I just, don't know. Just about enough of a crossover here for me, anyway. <laughs> the under-19s, absolutely not. <laughs> uh, also in the Irish Times there, uh, De Gea keen on captaincy as he closes in on New Deal. Of course, about uh, Manchester United goalkeeper David De Gea. The Irish Examiner leads with major ambition. Ryder Cup spot next on Larry's to-do list. And that has been the Anglin and a couple of the newspapers this morning. What is next for the golfer, Shane Lowry? We're all celebrating this and how brilliant he's been in his celebrations and how happy he is. But that happiness has been one of the main reasons why he's been able to put himself in position and win twice this calendar year. He's happier about all aspects of his life. It's not the thing that defines him anymore, being the golfer that he is. And by extension, he's happier on the golf course. There's less pressure on him and he's winning. So I think what we're seeing over the last 24 hours, the way he's managed to celebrate this, the way he's like, nah, I'm not going to Memphis this weekend. I think, in a weird way, that's actually going to be to to rubber stamp his credentials in the future as well when it comes to the Ryder Cup next year and to the four majors that we have between now and then as well. Fake news as well on the front page of the Irish Examiner. Mike Quirk and John Fogarty call on GA to clamp down on dummy teams. This is something that's been grinding your gears. Yeah, absolutely. Look, I, I, I know people saw the GA media whinging again, like, you know, but it's just, let's get it, like, we want to be as professional an organisation as we can be, you know, not just, I know it's an amateur organisation, the GA, but, you know, for, even for supporters going to uh, matches, buying programmes, you know, they should have some worth. You know, you're spending a fiver, whatever the case may be, on a programme. You know, the fans deserve to be treated a bit better than that, I think. And why can't we just have a squad announcement on a Thursday or a Friday, whatever the case may be, before a Saturday, Sunday game, and then an hour before throw-in, or an hour and 15, like we see with UEFA, you know, European Championship qualifiers, or whatever the case may be, and just announce the team an hour, hour and 15 before the game. Why, why can't we, you know, do something like that? You know, I was saying at the weekend... I know Kerry, Mayo, Donegal all did it. Dublin as well. And to be fair, Jim Gavin, this year hasn't been too bad. I think up till this weekend, he made one change to each team for each game. But again, like he brings in three players that weren't named in the team. And he has done it in previous years as well. Like, look, there's, there's nobody innocent in this thing. And as well, it, it comes back to the, the thing of squad numbers. I've always said, um, why can't we have squad numbers in the GAA? And again, it's another revenue stream for the GAA if you can get numbers and names printed on shirts you know there'd be loads of kids out there who'd want to have 13 Clifford on their back or you know 8 O'Shea whatever the case may be what number will Connolly be? <laughs> Jeremy Connolly probably be one of those who'd go for 99 27 27 <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it seems yeah exactly I got, I got that <laughs> sorry <laughs> Alvin no, this is more, like uh, no, I, I get the I get the the whole process of you and uh, your fellow Dublin beings trying to stir the pot here a little bit with this Jim McConnelly thing. You fool us all. <laughs> Jim McConnelly's not playing any football. Well, this year, I, I did say, you know, um, I, and I, the more I thought about it last week, I'm going. Jim Gavin never tells us anything. He never tells us anything. Um, you know, he squeezed the press conferences as time has gone on. We don't get any media stuff before games anymore. We might get one maybe before the semi-final. We used to get one every Thursday before games, even before league games, and that's slowly, slowly but surely he's being squeezed. He never tells us about injuries. We're always kept in the dark about absolutely everything. And the more I thought, I was like, why did he come out and tell us this? You know, it's there's there's something going on there. Mm. You know, conspiracy theorist Stephen oh. Doyle is in the house. <laughs> Anyway, uh, let's move on to the back of the Irish Independent, Tuesday Sports. Shane Larry quote there, I was so scared of messing it up again, admits Larry. Uh, Stark confided in his coach about anxiety, which gripped him on the morning of his open triumph. Again, they uh, def- uh, mentioned the David De Gea story. He wants captaincy and £375,000 a week United deal. David De Gea set his sights on being Manchester United's new captain, saying it is important he takes on a greater leadership role next season. Who would argue with that? Like, you know, the, the, apart from himself, what other captain material have they got in that squad? And down the bottom there, Colin Keyes writing, Model Army mobilised for Croker's biggest summer crowd. Wexford's first All-Ireland hurling semi-final in 12 years is expected to draw a crowd of around 65,000, the biggest of the championship to date. The Irish Daily Star this morning. 
goes with Awfully Proud, Lowry taken aback by how GA headquarters fans roared him on. Great moments actually, a couple of times when the score was read out at Croke Park on Sunday afternoon. Yeah, I wasn't there and it was on Sunday, I was actually up uh, Daily Mount Park watching Bows and Pats, but oh, yeah. um, I, I believe it was maybe a brilliant atmosphere every time they mentioned Shane Lowry. Yeah, it was fantastic. It was Oh, I, I, nah, I was going to say it was better than anything in, uh, on show on the games, but that's not true whatsoever. Maybe, maybe during the first game, it yeah. got a bigger loud, uh, cheer from everybody in the stadium than s some of the other events on, on, on the pitch. Like, But it was, it was amazing. There was some rumours during the rounds that they were actually going to show some of the golf on the big screen between the games at halftime and stuff like that, but that didn't actually materialise. Yeah. Because uh, they did that for Ireland might, France. Would there be rights issues there maybe with uh, Potentially, some yeah. sports in a public venue? Uh, he's on the front page as well of the Irish Daily Star. Slumber Party is the headline. Open Champs Victory Pub Crawl after sleeping with Claret Jug. There he is, pictured with Hugh Hurricane on the front of uh, the I star. Think that picture on the right actually is him in bed as well, isn't it? They, yes, they sorry, the main one, bed. yeah. Yeah. He pulled last night, is what he said on Instagram. <laughs> and it was, of course, the Claret Jug. Moving on to the racing post there, they've got um, a story by David Milne. Epic King, George Class, no penalty kick for 4-6, to six. and Abel says Gosden. And Abel is in top order for her biggest test of the year so far in Saturday's King George, the 6th and Queen Elizabeth Kipco Stakes. Death of C-Class, the filly who ran and Abel so close in the arc. Racing's mourning the loss of one of the best fillies in a scene this century after C of Class died yesterday. The back page of the Herald goes with Dublin era nearly over. Are you worried? Um, it's Paul Caffrey saying yeah, he foresees young Kerry men becoming dominant force. Makes some good points, doesn't he? Yeah, yeah. It's, um, How can you say that the Dublin era is nearly over? Well, you know, look, Stephen Cluxton, Keen O'Sullivan, James McCarthy, Michael Darren McCauley, all these guys now, they've got another couple of years left in them, but they're, they're not going to be there forever, and these are the key men. He's also mentioned Bernard Brogan, Kevin McManaman, and Owen O'Gara. Yeah. How much road is left in all of these fellas? It doesn't matter. They haven't needed Bernard Brogan. They don't really need Kevin McManaman. They definitely don't need Owen O'Gara. Well, Kevin McManaman got a point at the weekend. Vital points. Yeah. Absolutely vital. They would not have snuck past Roscommon without Kevin McManaman <laughs> on the weekend. <laughs> yeah, just well, somebody's just mentioned to us there about Kieran Archer. 3 4 uh, for the under 20s on Friday. Absolutely rip roaring performance. Uh, I do think the lifespan of this Dublin team will eventually evaporate. And he mentions those players that I mentioned there. As long as they're winning, everything is okay. But once a defeat comes and a lot of retirees come together, I think Dublin are going to be well back in the pack. I think that is absolute nonsense. I as should. long as they, as once a defeat comes, that that is going to be the thing that marks the beginning of the end for this Dublin team. The last time this Dublin team lost a championship game was just them levelling up to a different sort of beast entirely, where they were an outstanding generationally good team and now they're one of the, probably the best team of all time because mm -hmm. of that one defeat. I'd be worried if they lost again to be honest, they could step it up <laughs> once again, Jim Gavin could find another way of absolutely crushing everybody he comes up against. He said that Kerry are coming at a rate of knots, whether it happens this year or not I'm not so sure, but they are coming and when they come they will take over. I have to say it was actually Tommy, our producer, uh, mentioning Kieran Archer, he was he was actually seething, I could feel him spitting through the microphone there as he mentioned Kieran Archer. A very unhappy Meath man this morning. <laughs> a lot of nonsense. Um, moving on to the Telegraph Sports and um, the headline there, Klopp, we must start to protect our players. I actually was reading a bit about this last night, Jurgen Klopp. He's not happy with the amount of uh, games that, um, and not just his own players, he was talking about all players, but Liverpool are going to be assault, uh, taking part in seven different competitions this season because, of course, they do have to go to the Club World Cup uh, in December. But he's just talking about the demands put on players, 13-month seasons. Sadio Mane has played a ridiculous amount of football over the last year. He's, of course, went off to the... the well, actually, after the last, World Cup to last the year's uh, Champions League final, he went to the World Cup. And then this year's Champions League final, he's off to the Africa Cup of yeah. Cup Nations. So... It's something the Premier League need to look at, a proper break. I think there is look, they're, they're looking at a mid-season break this season. Um, but definitely, look, and I know people, Man U fans will say, you know, Jurgen Klopp wins again. And looking at, but look, I think he's genuinely talking about players across the board here. He wants the less demands on the players and that kind of thing. Down the bottom of the Telegraph front page there. Next up, Ryder Cup. Harrington wants Larry to lead team. Um, moving on to the cricket then. Plunkett struggles from World Cup to watching Netflix and Tasman Greenway writing, I want to be the next England netball coach. The back page of the mirror this morning is Captain Keeper Legend. That's Ole Gunnar Solskjaer telling David De Gea what he wants him to be. And as you can see there, disrespectful and arrogant, Chinese hosts blast Manchester City in a shock 
Manchester City are not being nice guys. Who'd have thunk it? They're at the centre of a diplomatic storm after the Chinese state media branded them disrespectful and arrogant. So this is an editorial following Manchester City's trip to Shanghai uh, for the Asia Trophy. So the government-owned news channel basically accused Pep Guardiola's side of only going to China for the money. No. I would have certainly thought they were going to China for really tough pre-season matches and this is exactly where you want to be before starting your domestic league a million miles away let's go to China for it it's definitely nothing to do with money <laughs> they must, I, this is absolutely extraordinary conspiracy theory stuff from the Chinese st state media they, the article here in the mirror says the city squad failed to engage with supporters in the same way as tournament rivals Wolves, West Ham and Newcastle and this article the Chinese article blasted Guardiola for refusing to speak to fans after City beat West Ham last Wednesday it said taken alone it might have been excusable as a one-off occurrence, perhaps due to jet lag or a packed schedule, but unfortunately it proved to be one example among many of the utter disrespect shown by, shown by City to their hosts during the tour of China, an attitude of arrogance and the belief that they were the main attraction was misplaced and stood in direct contrast to the other clubs. This is the key line though. Mm. Today, those clubs leave China with newfound respect and new fans. Manchester City leave China with neither. What are relations like between Abu Dhabi and China? It's a good question actually. I wonder is there something a little bit deeper to this uh, little arguments that's going on. There could be, there could be. I, my uh, geopolitical knowledge of the history of tensions between China and Abu Dhabi has been shown <laughs> up once again here, Stephen. You put me on the spot. Well, listen, maybe when the lads go over to uh, play the off the ball, the inaugural off the ball open, they might be able to do a bit of digging around over there. Just tell them not to use their Mandarin when they're over there. Yeah. <laughs> uh, moving on to the Irish Daily Mail, and on their back page, Philip Quinn writing, Time to party. Larry to take a break after open triumph. Open champion was Shane Larry unlikely to return to tournament golf until the lucrative FedEx Cup playoffs in the States next month. And uh, down here we've got Kylie. Of course, Limerick manager John Kylie. Limerick must be wary of canny cats. John Kylie warned his side to expect a real challenge against Kilkenny ahead of Saturday's all Ireland hurling semi final. And a picture there Irish heroes return after stunning Euro game success. A brilliant weekend, of course, for Irish athletics. A beaming Kate O'Connor and Sarah Healy returned home yesterday night with Team Ireland that showed off their medals they won at the European Under-20 Championships in Sweden. O'Connor first to medal at the Championships with a, a historic heptathlon. And um, yeah, brilliant, absolutely brilliant performance. Irish Athletics in a good place at the moment and a good time as well looking at the uh, Olympics for next year. The back page of The Guardian goes with contenders ready. Who will win the most exciting Tour de France title race in years? And it's been absolutely fantastic. You can see Julien Alaphilippe there in yellow showing the first signs of cracking on Sunday. A rest day yesterday, today's stage is going to be worth watching. And new blow for number 10, Cipriani's World Cup hopes fade as he misses Italian camp. This is not the final squad, obviously. Cipriani, he's only won two caps since Eddie Jones has taken over as England coach. He is not in the latest training squad. So it's been put down to selection with Jones continuing his policy of having two specialist fly halves, Owen Farrell and George Ford, backed up by Henry Slade and Piers Francis, who's both started their careers at number 10. So no place for Danny Cipriani will get Alan Quinlan's taken that very shortly. Yep, and the English Times as well, talking about that Cipriani story, Cipriani snub from Jones. Um, MCC make Lord's Test free to wear. The main Lord's Test match of the summer should be shown on free to wear television to capitalise on the success of the World Cup final, MCC has suggested. Just, I suppose, seeing the bounce in figures there and maybe looking at the long term effects for the game. And uh, again, another cricket story there, but in relation to Ireland, of course, Elizabeth Ammon writing that uh, James Anderson is losing his, fit, uh, his race to be fit for tomorrow's test match against Ireland at Lords after failing to recover from a calf injury. Just one continental newspaper we want to show you, the Gareth Bale story covered in ass and the translation there roughly means that Gareth Bale chose not to play against Bayern Munich, not the other way around. So that's interesting. I would have thought that perhaps, well to be fair, okay, as we can see here, this is Zinedine Zidane talking about this, so mm -hmm. it, you've got to take it with a little bit of a pinch of salt given it seems to be a, the, the two of them at loggerheads, but Gareth Bale potentially just does not want to play for Real Madrid anymore. More on that on Deal or No Deal a little bit later on. It is 7.59am this Tuesday morning and you're watching OTBAM, the sports breakfast show from Off the Ball. OTBAM is sponsored by Avancard, powered by Mastercard, and we are back with Mark Ty talking John Delaney and the FAI straight after these.